We'll be starting momentarily. Good afternoon. Welcome to our webinar today entitled Clothed in Injustice, the Ethics of Fast Fashion. My name is Max Latona. I am the Executive Director of the Center for Ethics in Business and Governance at St. Anselm College, and I will be the moderator for today's discussion. We are pleased to see so many of you here today. Um, we are over 100 in number and still gathering participants, but we regret that we are not hosting you in person. We are hoping, like all of you, that things will return to normal later this year and we can begin to once again offer our events in person. Before we get started with our event today, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the support and collaboration of the Gosstown Public Library, who provided the community viewing license for the film that is the background for today's discussion, as well as the work of St. Anselm College's Melinda Malik, who secured the viewing license for the college and helped plan this event. I'd also like to mention at the request of one of our panelists, Professor Bidlack, that this event is being offered in sympathy with UN Interfaith Harmony Week. Keep an eye out for announcements of other events in that series from Professor Bidlack. Finally, while this is a panel discussion, audience members will be permitted to ask questions by using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, once we're uh, done with the panel discussion, I'll read as many questions as I can but I apologize in advance for those questions that I am unable to get to. As per state law, I will remind all of you that this event is recorded and will be accessible afterwards on the center's website. Okay, let's get started with our topic. I'll say a few words by way of context before I introduce our panel and we get their perspective. Our topic today is the ethics of fast fashion and it is prompted by the documentary film, True Cost, an eye-opening film about the hidden human and environmental costs behind the clothing industry. I encourage you to watch the film if you haven't already. Uh, in fact, we have a trailer here for you just as a taste. We communicate who we are through clothing. It is fundamentally a part of what we wish to communicate about ourselves. We used to have a system, a fashion system. That has absolutely nothing to do with the fashion industry today. It has been reinvented. It's based on materialism. The problem is that comes at a really high price. <laughs> garment factory collapsed, killing more than 1,000. Clashes between clothes factory workers and riot police in Cambodia. Last November, 112 people were killed in another major factory fire. 30,000 Chinese workers and garment workers in Bangladesh were paying the price for cheap clothing. The promise of globalization was that it was going to be a win-win, that consumers in the rich world would get cheaper goods and people in the poorer parts of the world would get jobs and that those jobs would give them an opportunity to work their way out of poverty. This enormous, rapacious industry that is generating so much profit, why is it that it is unable to support millions of its workers properly? The actual business model is completely unsustainable. Unless you change that model, you can't change anything. When everything is concentrated on making the profits, what you see is that human rights, the environment, workers' rights get lost. My God, we can do better than this. <laughs> Yeah. 
As you can see, the film is a study of contrasts. It contrasts the high fashion of the Western world with the low poverty of the workers who produce that fashion. It contrasts the crush of consumers in a Black Friday shopping spree with the crush of rubble over a collapsed garment factory. It shows us on one side, the new fashions pouring into our stores every week, and on the other side, the toxic runoff pouring into the rivers in the regions where this apparel is manufactured. These things are clearly connected. The clothes we buy to keep up with the latest fashion may be cheap, but as the film shows us, they have a hidden cost to the environment and to the humans who labor in difficult conditions for low wages. So before we turn to our panel, I just wanted to give you a few numbers about this industry to give us a little perspective. Fashion is a huge business. In 2019, global retail sales of apparel and footwear reached nearly 2 trillion US dollars. It's expected to rise over 3 trillion by 2030. In her book, Overdressed, Elizabeth Klein reports that in 1930, the average American woman owned an average of nine outfits. Today, we each buy more than 60 pieces of new clothing on average per year. And where we once shopped season by season for items that were made to last, we now shop on impulse. We don't repair our clothes like we used to. Instead, we throw them away or we donate them. As it turns out, clothing doesn't play a major role in Americans' cost of living, unlike, say, healthcare, housing, or even education. Although we buy more clothing, we're actually spending far less money than ever before on our clothing, enabled by this giant fast fashion industry. And the reason for this, as the film shows us, is that uh, the clothes are made not here in the United States. In 1960, the US made 95% of the clothes we purchase and wear. But now it's only 3% of that clothing that we make. The rest is outsourced to low, low wage economies such as Bangladesh. And just taking Bangladesh as an example, there are an estimated 4 million garment workers in Bangladesh alone, working in some 5,000 factories. An estimated 85% of them are women who are making less than the equivalent of $3 per day. Their conditions are in many cases substandard. And I'll just say this, one of the grimmest examples of this would have been the disaster of Rana Plaza, when in 2013, an eight-story garment factory collapsed in Bangladesh, killing over 1,100 workers, most of them women. The workers had pointed out cracks in the building's structure, but their pleas were ignored by management and owners who were themselves desperate to keep the business of the retailers that had hired them. Okay, so that's enough for me. That's just a little bit of context in what we see in the film if you haven't seen it yet. But let's turn now to the panel to get some insight and perspective on the fast fashion industry and some of the ethical challenges that it raises. So we have four panelists with us today, all from the St. Anselm faculty. I'll begin with Bede Bidlack. Bede is an associate professor of theology at St. Anselm College. He teaches and publishes in the areas of creation theology, uh, anthropology and sacramental theology, and interreligious dialogue. He has developed a course, Theology and Creation, that examines the natural world as a source for theological reflection coming in fall 2022. Welcome, Bede. Hi, Max, thanks for inviting me. Next is Kyle Hubbard. Kyle is an associate professor of philosophy at St. Anselm College, where he teaches many different courses, including ethics and business ethics. Some of his favorite topics to teach and discuss in these courses are wage justice and, just, uh, and what businesses owe their employees. Welcome, Kyle. Thanks, Max. And I'm, I'm also a resident of Goffstown. For those that are joining us from the public library forum at Goffstown, welcome. Great. And our third panelist is Nicole Ayette, who is an associate professor of chemistry at St. Anselm College, uh, studying gas phase chemistry. Her interests in this chemistry have significant application to atmospheric and environmental issues, as well as to space and defense applications. Nicole, we're glad to have you. Thanks, Max, I'm glad to be here. And finally, we have Mike Mathias, an associate professor of economics at St. Anselm College, specializing in the historical impacts of mining activity on local communities. Mike is interested in the relationship between the limited amount of resources available and the desire of people around the world to improve their living conditions. 
with a focus on the impact economic development via natural resources has on surrounding areas. Welcome, Mike. Thanks, Max, and hello, everyone. Okay, so let's let's hear from each one of you. Look, to get started, let's just get your reactions to the film, your initial thoughts about it, and 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 the problems or challenges that it raises. And and Nicole, why don't we why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so as a scientist, I really watched this film from a very science perspective, and I thought it did a very compelling job of pointing out a lot of the localized concerns that fast fashion has from a, an environmental perspective. Um, it seemed to me that they kind of grouped those concerns kind of into two categories. One was in the production of the materials and the second in the conversion of those materials and exactly the environmental impacts of the two of those. Um, I thought it did a great job with its accuracy in the science. The science really was uh, solid and it made sense but what was really interesting to me was that this documentary was, um, was a couple years old and there's been some um, new developments in kind of both of those areas. So if we haven't watched the film, I thought it might also might be a good idea to just touch on where we've gone since then. Um, so in, at the time they were talking a lot about farmers and pesticides and the application of those pesticides. Um, it is certainly scientifically true that all of the crops that are being planted are designed specifically for an increased need of fertilizers and pesticides. And they did a pretty good job of dancing around the name Monsanto and inferring it a lot, but not actually saying it except for maybe once in the film. Um, but since then, it has become a more household name since Roundup has had a lot of um, Bad press, maybe is a good way to say it. In 2015, after this film was produced, the WHO labeled it as a likely carcinogen, though the EPA and the um, EU's analogous agencies have said the jury's still out on that. There are controversial studies going back and forth saying that the chemical that makes up Roundup might be responsible for endocrine disorders, fertility issues, and various cancers. That was really the cancers that they talked about in the documentary. Um, since 2015, more than 95,000 lawsuits have been filed against the makers of Roundup. Monsanto is no longer the parent company. Bayer is the parent company. And the first three lawsuits were settled in California for millions or billions of dollars apiece in civil court in which the plaintiffs were awarded money. Since then, actually just in June of the year, Bayer settled these lawsuits for about $10 billion, one of the largest civil lawsuits ever, civil judgments ever. Um, and they also set aside $125 billion for future claims, which is a very impressive sum of money, though Bayer has never admitted any wrongdoing and they still claim that the chemical that makes up Roundup is completely safe, though it has been pulled from an store shelf. Um, so from the materials perspective, that's kind of where that's sitting and a lot of people are very skeptical of Roundup. And then the, the secondary topic they covered was really about the pollution created often in the water supply after the production of these materials. And um, they really focused on tanneries in the Ganges River and the chromium production. And again, it is certainly true that that is definitely due to the chromium used to tan those hides. Uh, it is worth mentioning that chromium is one of 12 different heavy metals found at toxic levels in that river, many of which are not from the fashion industry. So there's a lot of different issues involved there. Um, but more recently in most of 2019, those tanneries were actually closed as a result of their um, contamination issues. The government has been trying to crack down on that and they have basically closed or reduced capacity. Um, and I found this, uh, Reading up on that, it was really interesting because you saw a lot of parallels to what we're going through now in this country in our public health crisis where closing large amounts of industry, just closing them and putting a lot of people out of, out of work for things that are beyond their control 
are uh, complicated economic issues. Um, and so the film really focused on those things, but I was also a bit surprised that the film didn't highlight more global issues, um, that we, it really focused in on personal stories from individuals, which really did elicit some very kind of emotional responses, I think, from the people in the film and from myself. But it's also really easy for us to say, that's not me, or distance ourselves from people that we don't have to interact with on a daily basis, even when we see those initial responses. And so I was a little surprised that they didn't follow up with things about climate change or ocean pollution or some of these more global issues that I think are also really relevant to this industry. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, I'd like to follow up with you later in our conversation after we've heard from the others about some of those um, global impact, if you will, of, of, of um, this industry. Um, but uh, let's turn now to Mike. Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit from your perspective of economics, what you see in the film? All right, uh, yeah, so you know, to me, the movie's a story about specialization and trade. So you know, unless you grow your own food, make your own clothes, build your own house, you know, you're engaging in specialization specialization and voluntary exchange of goods and services, trade on an individual level every day. So this allows you and I to consume many more things than we could produce on our own. Like, you know, I like it that I can trade my teaching services to buy oranges from Florida while I live in New Hampshire in the winter. As a food consumer, I like having this choice. So this movie is a story about this type of transaction with clothing and that these voluntary exchanges happen on a global scale. Um, so you know, why is it that we don't produce clothes in the United States? We could produce clothes much more efficiently than many of the countries that currently produce our clothing. But the reason we don't is the opportunity cost of producing those clothes in the U.S. is too high, meaning that our resources are better put to use producing other things like high-tech airplane parts or medical services. If we use them to produce clothes, we'd be giving up too much in the production of those other high-value things. So it was mentioned in the and even in the, um, the trailer, you know, the ideal of globalization of two countries specialize in the activity where they have what's called the lower opportunity cost in trade, they can both end up better on average. And it's similar to what we do every day as individuals. You know, so our clothes are produced elsewhere. The benefits are spread out amongst all US consumers who pay a lower price for clothing. And we have more money to spend on other things like, you know, GM cars or a new iPhone or Disney Plus. Right, and that can lead to more jobs and economic activity here in the US. And this type of specialization in trade has lifted millions of, uh, out of poverty around the world and maybe in, um, likely billions. And it's not just clothing, but all types of labor intensive manufacturing. Like 15 million people have been lifted out of poverty in Bangladesh since 1990. Now there are potential losers in this story, like someone who's worked at a facility in the United States that produced clothing before the trading began. So there's issues there. Um, and then, you know, Nicole mentioned this, but, you know, one issue where the ideal of this comparative advantage in trade where it gets more complicated is when the production of something has negative impacts on other parties that aren't part of the transaction. So if the production of clothing negatively impacts the environment, like through climate change or local water air quality, or you're cutting down rainforests, but those impacts aren't included in the cost of producing the good, then there's what's called a negative externality. The market doesn't capture this impact the price that you and I pay as end consumers doesn't reflect the cost to society. If you, if you could include it, you or I would pay a higher price. Now in the, in the movie, the chromium in the water in India due to the production of leather, which Nicole mentioned, is a perfect example of this. Now this isn't necessarily a world trade issue, but it makes it more complicated but it's, because it's harder to monitor and enforce standards or impose costs when the supply chain goes around the world. So that's a challenge of this globalization ideal. Now, the main focus of the movie is on the negative effects of the clothing industry that, that it has on the worker conditions and worker rights. So this isn't really an externality. You know, these workers are, economists would say they're part of the economic transaction. Economists would assume that these transactions are voluntary. Max mentioned this in the introduction, that these workers aren't being forced or coerced to, coerced to perform the tasks. So one question that I would like to explore is whose responsibility is it to ensure adequate working conditions for those who produce our clothing. You know, there's lots of options, the clothing manufacturing company, the clothing buyers, um, like the middlemen, the consumers like us who demand them and pay, um, you know, pay the end price, the workers themselves, the Bangladesh government, 
um, the World Trade Organization, you know, all of the above, you know, um, there's lots of parties here. And, you know, would consumers purchase clothing they knew to come from areas where workers are being exploited? If the answer is no, you know, how can we better provide this information to consumers? You know, in the end, it could come down to a question of information availability. You know, this is something that economists often assume in principles classes that, that um, buyers and sellers have perfect information. And so when we, you know, when economists defend the, the ability of specialization trade and these voluntary exchanges to provide benefits to society, this information availability is part of the story. So, you know, would you rather pay higher prices for clothing and help improve working conditions and producer practices? Um, you know, maybe the choice doesn't have to be made if what's called in the, in the video exceedingly high profits of the fashion industry are the culprit. You know, potentially the whole thing could be improved if some of those profits were used to ensure safer working conditions and environmentally sustainable practices. So that's, that's what I thought about um, when I watched the movie. Okay, thank you, Mike. So you, you see some positives. Uh, you see some of these what you called externalities. Um, I want to return to that in a moment. Um, and then you also cite maybe information and transparency as a way in which you might address it. I also want to talk about solutions in a few minutes as well. But let's turn now to Kyle and get an initial uh, reaction from Kyle. Kyle? Thanks, Max. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I am a philosopher and ethicist. So watching the film, I immediately went to some of those questions. There were really two fundamental questions that I thought that the documentary raised and raised point poignantly. And it's not the only documentary that raises those. There, there are others uh, that I've seen that have tackled other industries like the food industry, like the energy industry. Um, but the two questions I that I thought of uh, as I watched this were um, simply what are people for? And then what's the economy for? Um, so what are people for? Um, so some of the questions that could come under this are, are the workers in these developing uh, nations to be used for our, our own desires? Um, are we as consumers in the developed uh, nations, are we for acquiring uh, as many goods uh, as we can, maybe more than we need, right? The, the uh, introduction, the uh, trailer there that Max played uh, mentioned uh, materialism. Um, are we for materialism, right? Is that a good end of, of human life and activity? Um, and, are we for as people, whether as consumers or as uh, producers, are we for uh, keeping the economy growing? Are we for uh, keeping GDP growth rates uh, as, as high as we can get them? Um, so these are some of the questions that came up. Um, also, the, that second question, what, what's the economy for? Uh, so some of the questions that I thought of about uh, in this under this, uh, this general question, are there better ways to, to measure the economy uh, than GDP growth? Maybe Mike might be able to talk a little bit about that. Um, how do we measure uh, human flourishing? Uh, to what extent does human flourishing require uh, economic growth, require wealth growth? Um, and those aren't those aren't easy questions to answer. So, so uh, I guess like a good philosopher, this uh, film raised a, a lot of questions for me and not as many answers. Love it, Kyle. We're going to come back to those questions in a moment. Thank you. Uh, and now finally, last but not least, Bede, uh, from a theological perspective, what did you see when you uh, watched this film? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Max. As you had mentioned earlier, um, you were inviting uh, participation of, uh, you know, not just the Catholic Christian tradition, but also the traditions of the religious traditions of the world, which didn't explicitly get um, addressed in the film, but but are nonetheless there if you if you know how to see them. Uh, but I'd, I'd first like to start with uh, our, our own location being a Benedictine uh, Catholic school and kind of working out from there, uh, thinking about the moral resources that um, religions can offer, and uh, the role of Saint Benedict would be one place to start. In chapter 31 of Benedict's rule, uh, he addresses the seller 
uh, that is the basically the quartermaster of the monastery, and says that uh, such a man should hold the uh, objects of the monastery in the same reverence as the vessels of the altar. And those vessels on the altar uh, hold the body and blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, um, there, there's a, a, a sacredness to them, not just to those vessels, but to all of the, the objects in the monastery. So while uh, it, it might be uh, easy, at least I, I find that many people have a instinctual connection to the natural world and uh, don't have as much of a leap to extend the idea of there being a sacred universe to the natural world. Uh, what Benedict is saying is that that also applies to, to artifacts, human artifacts. And in this case, we're talking about clothing. And so the, the, the message is that, you know, of course, you know, clothing isn't bad. Um, material, the material world isn't bad. It's, it's good. And even St. Benedict is saying it's sacred. And why is Benedict saying that? It's because he's pulling that from the scriptures themselves. Uh, the opening of the, the Bible, the creation story in Genesis, God says that the world is good. Humans are good. Uh, moreover, humans are uh, made in the image of God. So uh, this raises the question that does come up in the film, uh, that question of human dignity. That um, you know maybe uh, you know philosophy, economics, and public policy can't exactly address, but it's something that uh, all the religions of the world address. This uh, essential um, element of human dignity, and it came up where the workers are trying to get not just a living wage, but uh, working conditions that recognizes their own dignity. So. Uh, Expanding from there into the other religious traditions, uh, so much of the movie takes place in Bangladesh. Um, most of Bangladesh are, are Muslim. Um, in Islam, uh, human dignity is defined by humans being, they say, died in the die of Allah. In other words, we have a, a, a sacred origin and a, a sacred destination. Um, also, uh, Cambodia uh, appears, and sadly, it appears in a Buddhist uh, funeral. Um, Buddhists, uh, of course, uh, recognize the interconnectedness of, of all things, of all beings. And so it breaks down this dichotomy between the natural world and the human world, that there really is only one world. And when uh, Kyle references human flourishing, uh, what we really mean is uh, human and earth flourishing. Uh, the human cannot flourish uh, without a flourishing environment. And these ideas come together wonderfully in the most significant document of the 21st century, the Dato Si, where you have the, the religious leader of 1.8 uh, bil uh, billion Catholics, I believe, um, addressing uh, his, his followers by saying, uh, look, there is this uh, intimate connection between the natural world and human flourishing, and the two can't be separated. So if you take just that document and, and you have interreligious cooperation with just the, the Muslims who represent another 2 billion people, you're, you're already motivating 4 billion uh, people on, on the earth out of the 7 billion people. Expand that into, into Buddhism. And then uh, the, the message is that uh, religions cannot be kept out of this uh, conversation with regards to uh, social and environmental justice, because um, uh, economics and public policy uh, can address part of the problem, but it's not going to be sufficient enough to, to motivate, motivate people to uh, actually uh, make a change in terms of their own consuming habits. Hey, thank you, Bede. Uh, this is very interesting that there are resources in these different religious traditions that might help um, to solve this problem. I'd like to, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about the nature of the problem, though, especially for people who haven't seen the film. So there's a human and an environmental cost that this garment industry is exacting uh, upon um, workers in these um, low-wage economies, upon the environment that they live in. But also, Nicole, you intimated the global environment. I want to go back to that a little bit because you tantalized us a little bit. So we've seen that, yeah, um, the tanneries can can pollute the, um, the local water sources with uh, chromium, a heavy metal, and cause birth defects and other uh, other illnesses. But 
you know, people who are buying clothes here in the United States at H&M or Zara or all these, these clothing retailers, they don't realize they're contributing to global pollution or climate change. Make that connection for us for a moment. How is it that, that this garment industry is really impacting all of us in some kind of negative fashion, if you could? So um, estimates right now suggest that about eight to 10% of all global carbon dioxide is a result of the garment industry at some point. So that might be in the production of materials, the shipping of the clothes. Um, so that's more than China, that, or that, not China, that is more than uh, Germany's exporting CO2. That is more than how much Japan makes in CO2 every year. And so we are exceeding industrialized nations' um, climate concerns just in the fashion industry. And of course, this is spread across different countries. And so you'd have to be a little bit careful about how you count those things. Um, but they estimate somewhere just, just under 10% of global CO2 as a result of these processes. Um, it's also a major consumer of water. So something like 80 trillion liters of water a year goes into the fashion industry. Um, something like 20% of industrial waste, they estimate, comes from the fashion industry. And this is, of course, distributed worldwide, um, but it certainly is significantly impactful. One thing I did learn after watching this film, of course, I spent a lot of time online reading things. And one thing I never realized was that we put something like the city of Manchester, for example, would put something like 800 pounds of microplastic waste into the oceans as a result of washing these clothes every year. So mm. we significantly increased the amount of synthetic fibers that our clothes are made out of. Synthetic fibers are made basically of plastic and that plastic gets shed every time we wash our clothes. And so the estimates are that individually we contribute several pounds a year um, and they think about 35% of all microplastics in the ocean are related to, to just us washing our clothes every year. And so, you know, I, I had thought a lot in the past about how much water we use to produce cotton or the general flying fabric back and forth from places, but I had never really considered its impact by washing it or mm. the fact that now we're making things out of synthetic fabrics, they're not decomposing when we throw them into our landfills in the same way that a pair of denim would have 50 years ago. And so there's really these significant and profound impacts when you start to think about these types of things. Great, thank you, Nicole. Um, so one thing I think you're seeing then is that once these clothes are made, they're not going anywhere. <laughs> they're, they're sticking around. Interesting. Right, they're not biodegradable. Yeah, uh, so good. Well, so there's the environmental cost and the human cost. So, you know, we saw that in the images of the collapsed rubble or the collapsed uh, factory in Bangladesh. Um, that's horrific. Um, but there are, you know, many other examples of uh, substandard conditions in which these workers are, are, are living and working. Um, so I'm wondering, let's talk, let's think a little bit about that because, you know, Mike, going back to something you mentioned, um, you know, someone might say, well, nobody forced these people to take a job and they're clearly taking these jobs because the alternative is worse, which is unemployment and poverty. Um, so how, how would you convince, well, how would you respond to that challenge that, that, that these workers took these jobs freely and therefore they're not um, being treated in some kind of you know, inhumane fashion given that we've given them an opportunity not to work. They're not being enslaved in that regard. What would you say to that, Mike? Uh, I mean, I, I guess I would probably agree with it. I, I don't know, you know, <laughs> on, like, um, Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's lots of examples of this, even in the United States, going back, you know, if you look at our history and the, the arc of labor relations in the United States, it was ugly and it was messy and people moved from rural areas into urban areas for opportunity and higher levels of income. 
and there were bad things that happened. There were wars fought in over in coal mines between workers and the owners of the mines in Appalachia. I mean, it's um, so that that's where my head in first goes. I mean, not that that that's what I want or I think is the ideal, but um, that that what's what we saw is that there's opportunity, but that there's costs and that that's been what we've seen in other places, including here in, in our uh, in our not too distant past. But couldn't you argue, and maybe Kyle or Bede, you could jump in on this. Couldn't you argue that these low wage workers are being taken advantage of because of their, you know, impoverished conditions? So they're desperate. They want to feed their children. Um, so they've got no other alternative. So these large manufacturers are making billions and billions of dollars a year for these retailers are taking advantage of their desperation. Um, so let, so uh, let me say one thing about that. So one thing that, that, that I think about is, um, you know, cause you might say, well, you know, let's not give them this horrible job. Let's, uh, you know, provide foreign aid to the country and then they can build up their country in a different way. Um, but historically foreign aid hasn't worked very well and big, um, broad um, things like ending poverty. Foreign aid, you know, has been shown to do really well on when there are specific goals, like let's end malaria in this certain country, or let's end African river blindness, a lot of health initiatives, um, you know, where there's specific, measurable, trackable goals and, um, uh, you know, and, and things that they're trying to accomplish. When it's real broad, like ending poverty, foreign aid doesn't do very well. And so my, what I would say is, um, you know, what's the alternative to, you know, providing a, a job in this economic opportunity? Hmm. Yeah. Kyle, Kyle or B, do you want to jump in on that? And I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah. I, I mean, there's the the first question you asked about about freedom, um, and I think it is a legitimate question: is what what counts as as freedom? Am, am I free to choose? Um, hmm. Am I freely choosing a job when the alternative is, um, right, dire poverty, poverty or some or something else, right? Um, I hesitate to say that counts as that I'm freely uh, choosing that. You know, it's a bit like, um, you know, if somebody holds a gun to my head and uh, tells me to to rob a bank with them. I'm not sure I'm fully free to resist. To resist that, right? And we can talk about how um, how complicit I am in, in each situation, how responsible I am for my choice. Um, so that's that's one question. I mean, I think we we really have to get at what what counts as freedom. What goods actually do I have to have access to um, in order to be in order to be free? Hmm. Um, and then, uh, but then you know, my began to talk about other alternatives, then I think that's one of the real challenges, right? The other alternatives are not easy. We've seen examples of this from those uh, in the clothing industry, like Tom's uh, Tom's shoes, uh, right? I mean, the, very famously, they give away or have given away, I don't know if they still do, I don't, I'm not up on it in the last year or so, but they've given away uh, a pair of shoes for every, uh, for every pair of shoes that you buy. Um, you know, in an impoverished area, often in the places where their shoes are being manufactured. Um, but both economists and ethicists have, ar have argued this actually depresses the local economies. It um, actually takes away jobs and takes away development in those countries. Um, so even something that sounds really positive, like I'm going to donate this, uh, we're going to donate these shoes, um, it ends up having uh, the opposite effect than uh, than what's intended. Hmm. Something yeah. similar, Kyle. The the boxes that you can put your clothes in, like the Planet Aid, I think. A lot of those clothes, same kind of thing, end up in markets. Then and, and you're crowding out jobs for local textile producers, in you know a lot of countries, many times in like sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was one of my surprises from the film is uh, that they said that only 10% of the clothes that are donated to like Goodwill and, and so forth are, are actually resold. And the rest, you know, go back uh, to, to, to these other areas of the world that, and often um, disrupt the economy. But, um, you know, Mike had said something uh, about the, the labor movement. And that seems to me, you know, where the solutions lie is that People want to have uh, not just living wage, but um, good working conditions. And it, and it really needs to come from 
uh, the, the people on the ground to determine just what that is, uh, which can seem quite distant from, from where we are. But at the same time, um, we, we do interface with these uh, uh, big manufacturing companies and these big clothing companies. And you know, we can tell them that we do want and we do care how our clothes are, are made. Uh, and, and that's really where we can vote with our dollars. I do want to get to solutions in a moment, but I, I want to get to first to talk about a little bit about who's responsible primarily for this, uh, for these environmental uh, impact that, that Nicole has described uh, for the impact on human beings that we've seen in the film and talked a little bit about here. So what are the, uh, I mean, the, the possibilities? Well, um, we, could, we could start with uh, the consumer. And I think, Bede, you've pointed that out here that we bear some responsibility for this um, in the way that we spend our money. Um, what about the retailers, these corporations? Uh, are they responsible for um, what some of these sweatshops, which are not owned by them, but I think are contracted by them, are they mm -hmm. responsible for what, uh, what they're doing? Um, are the owners and the managers of these sweatshops responsible? How about the governments in Bangladesh or Cambodia or any of these other places where there are substandard conditions. Um, how about the, the, um, the, the workers themselves? Are they responsible for trying to change the, the conditions that they're working in? So I, I'm gonna throw this out there to all of you. Where does the responsibility primarily lie, if anywhere, uh, for the abuses, if you will, of the garment industry? Any thoughts? Uh oh, we're all guilty. <laughs> Uh, that's that's easy. Well, and and you know, you know, going back to to drawing upon the wisdom of the religions of the world. I mean, that's one of the fundamental teachings of of Buddhism that we're we're all uh, interconnected. So what happens uh, in in these uh, in the sweatshop in Bangladesh is going to have um, repercussions uh, on on our life here in the United States or or, or in Europe and so forth. And of course, the religions of the world have been saying uh, something like that uh, uh, for centuries. And, and now we're seeing that concretely as um, people are moving around trying to find better, more livable working conditions. And um, you know, today we call them you know, refugees, right? Um, we're, we're all one human family. Uh, and so a, as a, a human being, we should care for our brothers and sisters. And we see this uh, an example of interfaith cooperation in documents like on human fraternity, which is a joint document between Pope Francis and uh, the Grand Imam at the, in the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, uh, there they both said, look, uh, uh, human flourishing is, is everyone's responsibility. And what happens in Bangladesh or Cambodia is gonna have uh, an impact uh, on our life and our, our, our physical lives and our moral lives uh, here, even in the United States or, or Western Europe. Um, so in, in terms of responsibility, it's not uh, enough to um, try to find someone to blame, but to all of us uh, to be involved in different solutions. Hmm. So Max, where, where, where I go, oh, sorry, Kyle, did you wanna? No, go something? ahead. You know, my, my initial thought to answering that question is, is it goes to the information piece, you know, that somewhat, you know, it, being the end consumer, it is really difficult to find this kinds of information. It, it's possible, right? You can do some research, um, you know, but we buy and interact in the market with lots of different products every single day. It's really difficult to track all of this information for everything you buy. Um, but it's somebody's job to source these, these materials at some point, right, at one of these companies. And somebody knows and is making the decision that they're going to source clothes from a place that is treating their workers this way. You know, I mean, so and, and you could say that that's being driven by the maybe a manager who's answering to a board because of a short term shareholder profit incentive. You know, that that's definitely probably part of the problem. Um, but somebody is making the, the decision like I'm going to, you know, get my clothes from this place and they're aware of what's happening. Kyle? Yeah, just to follow up on both uh, what Bede and Mike had said, um, I think it is helpful. While, while I think we're all responsible, right, <laughs> on, on one level, it's, help, it's helpful to distinguish our responsibility because uh, uh, we don't want to take responsibility for things that we can't, that we can't change. We want to take responsibility for things that we can change. Um, 
And so, uh, so I think it's helpful to kind of distinguish between the kind of direct complicity, the direct responsibility that say, um, you know, the company like H and M or or, uh, or their suppliers have, and then the um, complicity that uh, or responsibility that we as consumers have. Um, and so each of those, um, our responsibility increases the more knowledge that we have. And so uh, those that are on the ground in those places, as Mike mentioned, right, somebody is making that decision somewhere to source from this place that isn't treating their workers well. So there's respons there's greater responsibility there. Yet as consumers, right, for those of us that have watched this film, right, we might have had, we might now have greater responsibility than we uh, might have had before if we had no idea about what was going on uh, in this. So as we gain more as we gain more uh, experience and as we gain more knowledge, then our responsibility actually increases. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, it occurs to me that a lot of people in that chain of, uh, uh, of uh, causality here might, might argue they don't really have much choice. For example, um, if you're um, a family that has limited means, even here in the United States, of which we have plenty, um, you say, I can't afford to pay more for my children's clothes. I, I have to find the cheapest, you know, t-shirts and jeans that I can find just to make ends meet. Um, so I don't have that choice to go find, you know, um, a, a clothing manufacturer, which there are some, for example, Patagonia, who, in, who practice environmentally conscious uh, 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 manufacturing. Um, and then the, the corporations, the H&Ms and so on would say, look, we don't have a choice. If we break, jack up the price of our clothes because we, you know, we employ better labor and practices, um, we'll go out of business. Um, you know, uh, we'll lose uh, uh, the, 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 the consumers because they won't buy our clothes anymore, et cetera. So they don't have the choice. And then the, um, the owners of these sweatshops and the managers of sweatshops who contract with the retailers say, we can't improve our standards and wages because then the retailers won't hire us. They'll hire some other sweatshop. We'll go out of business, but we don't have a choice. And the workers who work there say, we don't have a choice. The alternative is abject poverty and starvation. We need these jobs. So it seems like it is all about choice. Mike, you talk about choice, but I wonder how much choice really is there? And if there's no choice, then is there responsibility? So I'm, I'm throwing that out there as a devil's advocate argument. What would you guys say to that? Well, it's giving up on human Nicole. intervention. Nicole, well, let's, start, let's hear from you. Nicole, please. Can I add a, I'm going to add another layer of complexity to your question too, because clearly there's, there's, there's these levels of choice and these levels of responsibility, but there's also this um, societal expectation of fashion mm. because, so I, we actually talked about this in uh, one of my classes yesterday and, you know, a student commented that every time she scrolled through her Instagram or pick her favorite website, there were ads everywhere. And the, and they touched on this a little bit in the, in the documentary about how there used to be two seasons in fashion. You'd get summer clothes and winter clothes and things didn't go out of style very quickly. And society has, has this additional transition to well, I've taken an extra half an inch off this t-shirt somewhere and therefore you now need to, have, there's this pressure to have this, the new look, the new t-shirt. And if you need to do that, you at some level might need to pay $4 for it because you now have to buy seven t-shirts this year if you want to stay mm. in fashion. And if that is some thing that is a societal pressure that certain people feel the need to, to live up to, um, and so I also think there's this additional, I don't know if it's a peer pressure responsibility. Um, certainly I'm glad I'm not 20 years younger than I am um, in which these things are really uh, complicated. Right? I mean, it, you see our students always wanting to be up in fashion and, and there's certainly societal pressure for those things that it's beyond the, just the consumer responsibility there's there's somewhat of an external pressure and then that also drives that low price because of that that secondary issue yeah no that's a great point nicole we there are larger cultural forces here at work um of consumerism and materialism which was mentioned i think by both Bede and kyle earlier um uh, you know this idea that um 
that in order for me to be normal, in order for me to be happy, I need to buy. I need to go out and buy, purchase things and, and uh, get the latest fashion. And, and, and it's hard for people to resist that. Um, so I like the idea that it's ultimately on us as consumers, but it's easier said than done, especially for people who don't have a lot of money and who are very, very busy. So let, let's talk a little bit about, oh, wait, B, you were going to say something a moment. Yeah, ago. I just wanted to pipe in here. You, you're, yeah. you kind of painted this really dark picture that, um, you know, this is the way it is and there's, there's no way out of it. Um, you know, the, the humans invent, we're innovative. We think of solutions. Uh, and so, okay, you know, if we stop, if we don't change anything, then these companies will go out of business. They're not going to go out of business. The bad companies will go out of business, but the innovative companies will, will find uh, solutions. Um, you know, if you want to draw from, you know, the, the fashion industry, think of Zappos, right? So, I mean, how could you possibly sell shoes without um, being in a shoe store? Um, you'd lose all the, you'd lose all your money in shipping costs. Well, the, the founder of uh, Zappos, God rest his soul, um, found a solution to that. Um, uh, likewise, even in, in, if you, you can apply that, not just to the economics and the business of it, but um, also to the environmental impact. Um, people are finding solutions, very creative solutions. And that's one of the wonderful things about the film is that it uh, not only presents the problem, but it does uh, really uh, uh, foreground some fantastic people who are coming up with remarkable solutions. Well, let's, let's get to solutions. Okay, so you brought it up. Um, let's start with you, Mike. So Mike, you're an economist. Um, I'm assuming that um, you have some confidence, uh, however minimal, in, 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 um, in capitalism and in, in, in markets. Um, do you think that, that the market, if left unfettered, will, will figure this out, that eventually workers will demand better conditions and they won't work for these, these sweatshops and the sweatshops will have to improve their conditions and so on and so forth? Or do you think we need regulation? Uh, do we need maybe government to step in and say, you know what, we need policies to protect these workers. Um, the market's not going to fix anything. Capitalism is rapacious, and uh, and we won't uh, we won't uh, we won't get anywhere by just letting people uh, do what they want. What do you think? Yeah, so I'll give the the pure economist answer that it depends, and it's a mix of both. You know that um, that you know there probably will be some some market solution going on, but you know the one of the issues that, that this movie kind of highlights is the way that this has kind of moved around over time, you know, and like um, there's an effort to reduce the amount of resources we use in, in, in developed countries in producing things, you know, it's called decoupling. And, um, you know, it looks really good in some countries that we're producing more, we have economic growth, but we're using less resources. But, but when you account for all the stuff that we import that's, that's being created around the world, it actually doesn't look so hot that that we might not be decreasing. You know that we're kind of just moving around where where the resources are being taken from, and so um, you know, like leaving the market by itself, I would think that some of the workers in Bangladesh, some some conditions might improve, but some companies might move down the road somewhere else uh, and figure out another place that they can set up shop and have you know conditions that aren't very good and you know, keep going down the, the value chain, so to speak. Um, so, and, you know, in terms of regulation, I mean, there are regulations, right? There's the WTO, there's, there's, there's trade rules that, you know, that um, should be enforced. And so, you know, I'm not a, like a trade lawyer. I don't have that, that expertise to know, um, you know, what the rules are for, you know, worker coercion or, um, you know, whether or not, you know, there, there are routes for these workers to actually organize and, file complaints, not just with some local, potentially corrupt government, but kind of going up the chain. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably a mix. I mean, that's not the most satisfying answer probably, but. Well, no, that's, that's good. Kyle, what do you think about that? Um, what do you think about the solutions here? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, not speaking as an economist, but um, I mean, there are, from the consumer side, there are some possible market solutions, right? That. Um, if I'm willing to buy less clothes, but I have a certain clothing budget, right? If I if I know that there are clothes that are going to last longer than the than the cheaper clothes that, uh, let's be honest, I I often buy, um, then I, 
I should be willing, I, sh uh, you know, should be willing to buy, uh, buy the clothes that would actually last longer, might actually save me money in the long run. Um, so there might be some uh, just market solutions to that. Um, but in in terms of uh, in, in terms of broad solutions too, I, I think um, I think we have to consider the role of of business. I think it's easy sometimes to say that look, I mean Bangladesh and some of these other countries, they need to enforce the laws that they have on the books, and they do have laws on the books about minimum wage, as the uh, the documentary mentioned. But they tend to ignore them in local areas because they're afraid of losing the losing the companies. Um, but if you look at just the size of at least the really large corporations, the Amazons, the the WalMarts that that do have a role in the in the clothing industry here, um, their their size of their company, just from a from a money perspective, is is larger than the GDP at, of most of these countries that they're in. So they have more real power than a lot of these governments do. So I think whatever the solutions are, the businesses are going to have to be a part of that solution. Can I say one, one other thing, Max, uh, before yeah, sure. you move on, just, just sure. in terms of like the, the solutions, I, you know, I, th there's lots of different ways that the system could be changed. Um, but, you know, in terms of like within the system, I wanted to mention a couple of things. You know, we've talked a lot about consumers, you know, um, you know doing some, some research and voting with their dollars. Um, but another way is to really track where your your investments are, are being used. There's a lot of sustainable um, investment funds out there. So, you know, I'd encourage everybody to pay attention to where your retirement money is getting getting used, where it's getting invested. I mean, that's, you know, beyond buying a house, that's probably the biggest pot of financial capital you'll have in your life. And how is that getting used? You know, and so that's something you can direct. And then, you know, the you know, I, I don't know all the ramifications and I don't want to get political or anything, but it, the movie mentions uh, uh, exceeding like exceedingly high profits as an issue and a wealth tax or a tax that's not just on the flow of income, but actually on wealth um, could be a potential solution. Um, you know, you could think about either raising the corporate tax or increasing the wealth tax to encourage like longer term patient capital and patient investing, which could help um, some of these problems. Mike, explain that last point a little bit more. How is it that a, a higher tax on corporate profits is going to discourage the kinds of things we see in this film, uh, the garment industry? Can you make that connection for us? Oh, um, yeah, I, when I made the comment, I was, in, I was really thinking about like the wealth tax on the shareholders okay. um, because corporate, so, so yeah, so maybe I, I slightly misspoke. I probably shouldn't have said corporate tax rates um, because those rules can change from one country to the next. So yeah, so changing the corporate tax rate in the US, you know, some of these companies, they're really smart. They might put their operations in the lower tax country. So I'm not sure that does fix the problem. So that's a- okay, But, but you you're saying on that- uh, So you're talking about an, an a tax on investment capital gains or something higher rate will yes. make investors a little more thoughtful about where they're putting their funds. Uh, what, what's the what's the connection there? Um, so, um, well, that you know, when you turn over your short-term investments, that's when you realize the gains, right? right? And yeah. so that's when you have to pay a tax on it. And so um, it could make people think, investors think about how they maybe potentially invest in um, longer-term capital. Uh, projects, you know, many sustainable projects on the market uh, are competing with other types of investments that don't have the same types of challenges in the short term. Um, so that's kind of where what that was meant to. Okay. Get. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, Bead, tell us from your perspective. Um, you mentioned religions as possibly a resource for for solutions here. Can you explain what you mean? And yeah, well, not not just um, possibly, but absolutely. I mean, the major social uh, movements have always been led from a religious basis. Uh, you know, the Jewish story is the story of the Exodus. And the story of the Exodus isn't just God coming in and, you know, sweeping up everyone out of Egypt. But instead, the, 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 the population uh, of the Israelites themselves were involved in their own uh, uh, freedom from slavery uh, in, in Egypt. 
um, the civil rights movement, um, Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, a Christian himself, inspired by a Hindu named Gandhi, who liberated uh, Britain without a shot. Uh, and in, for the, the Buddhists, you have the example of the Dalai Lama trying to uh, win his country back and so forth. So the, the, the fact is that most uh, uh, people in the world still practice uh, some type of a religion, and it can be a, an extremely powerful moral force for, for change, it, even so much so that you could argue that, that it, it is the only uh, uh, force that has peaceably uh, brought about significant uh, moral change. Hmm. Yeah, good. Interesting. And Nicole, let's hear from you about solutions. What do you think? So um, science certainly got us into some of these problems. Um, so I don't want to claim that it can get us out of all of them, but certainly hmm. there are new technologies all the time about better greenhouse gas capturing or lowering emissions or more efficient watering, those types of things from a climate change and pollution perspective are certainly um, high investing right now in terms of, of things that people that are on people's radar. Um, one thing that was particularly surprising to me while I was doing some research for this is also the environment in some ways evolving itself. And so um, there was an, a new bacteria that was discovered in Japan in 2016 in a very highly polluted um, plastic disposal area that was found to solely consume and break down plastics and particular plastics. So it was a bacteria that had evolved that didn't nobody had ever found before, was isolated from dirt, and the only thing it did was consume um, acrylics and fab these same types of fibers that are found in fabric. And so scientists have tried to isolate it, tried to identify how it works, um, maybe tried to increase the enzyme production of these. There's some thought that maybe they could be um, employed in kind of your septic systems or your sewage systems to deal with some of these microplastics before they end up in the water supply. Um, so there's also those kind of new environmental um, evolutions that aren't even necessarily human created, though they might be human manipulated at this point um, to try to help bring us into some of these new things. Love it. Okay, but, um, good. Nicole, can I ask you a question? Is there a danger of uh, us being too optimistic about technology just getting out of this environmental mess? Yes, period. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of possibilities. Some of them might work really well. It will likely be incremental steps from a lot of different things that get us out of a lot of different envir environmental messes. It will not be one magic bullet solution. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, on this note, I want to turn to the Q&A. We've got some questions from our audience and um, I want to encourage everybody uh, else who's still out there uh, listening. You're welcome to put a question in the Q&A and I'll see if I can get to them. So I'm going to start with one that's related to the solutions. Um, this is from Joyce. She asks about unions. What is your take on the role of unions to improve conditions? So Mike or Kyle, do you guys want to tackle that? What about unions? Could they be a part of the solution here? I'll let you go, Kyle. Okay, I'll go. I'll go first. I know you've got some background with unions and coal mines and things like that, but um, yeah. So, I mean, one one thing we did not talk about in the documentary, which was one part, was that there was some union busting going on, right, at one of mm -hmm. the one of the one of the factories. They are, I believe, the that was illegal, right, in in the in Bangladesh where it was, I, I believe. Yeah, for, but Kyle, for those who maybe didn't see the film yet, um, the woman describes quite tearfully how she was leading a group of women who were advocating for better conditions. They were locked in a room and men were beating them uh, with clubs uh, on their torsos, presumably where they couldn't be visibly show the, the injuries. It's a horrific scene. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely one of the more disturbing parts of, of the documentary. Um, so, uh, so, so I want to, I want to say yes, right? Um, Bede mentioned the, the role of religion, um, 
certainly the Catholic tradition going back, uh, you know, more than a century, but including John Paul II argues in his encyclical on human work for that, um, at least the Catholic social teaching recognizes that the right of the workers to unionize is a fundamental right mm -hmm. of all of all labor. Um, and uh, it's it's not because he thinks that uh, you know that's that's the only solution to the problem here, but um, but uh, right capital on one side right the the companies that control capital that control the the means of of uh, manufacture here have have a certain real power, and so the only way for an individual worker is not going to be able to. To do much or say much to to their boss, but it's only when the workers can work collectively um, that they're able to have uh, to have a kind of countervailing power. Um, Good. Mike, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I I think unions could definitely play a role here. Um, I, I think another part of the, of this, though, you know, the literacy rate in Bangladesh is only like seventy four percent. Um, so there are other factors here that are holding back probably some of these increased governance efforts, you know, that, um, you know, it, it, it's hard to, you know, know you need to go to a meeting if you can't read the flyer. Um, so, you know, there are um, some other ways that that effort could be improved. Um, and I'm not saying that it's, you know, foreign aid's job to do that, but, you um, you know, increasing literacy could be helpful in this regard. Um, you know, the the expected years of schooling in Bangladesh are pretty high um, and it's getting better, you know, so they're making improvements in this regard. Um, but, you know, in terms of in terms of unions, um, I don't know if that's going to be the, the full answer. Um, although, I mean, it's been successful in developed countries in doing things like worker conditions. When, it, when you start talking about pay and profits, that may be a different story. Um, but, you know, you could argue that, you know, improving worker conditions is, has been like the core reason for unions to exist. Yeah, good. Okay, so some other questions and comments we have. Okay, so this one here for is for you, Nicole. Um, I mean, other people are welcome to jump in, but Blake asks, what could change with the use of quote unquote organic pesticides? I don't know too much about this, Nicole, but is in terms of the pesticide industry, is that a solution? Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't know a lot about pesticides either. Um, okay. I, I think there's always, there's always a cost benefit analysis you have to do with some of these things where a little bit might be okay, but then we become significantly reliant on other things. So the film talks a lot about the genetically modified Monsanto seeds, which were genetically modified so that they were um, resistant to Roundup, which is a pesticide discovered in the 1970s. And so from a production standpoint, the advantage to using these seeds are you don't have to walk, somebody, an individual doesn't have to walk around and pluck individual strips of grass out of their cotton and you could really increase production because you could effectively um, remove all of your weeds without having to do that on an individual basis. And if you did that in something that was the size of my living room, that is fantastic. It's a very small issue. But when you start to spray Roundup from airplanes to solve that problem, and then you end up with these, this groundwater contamination, those end up being significant problems or we just have never studied things at large enough scales that we know what the impact, impacts are going to be. And so sometimes we also study them at a very small scale. And then when we scale them up, we, in these cases, often don't want to admit that we were wrong um, or that we say, well, it probably diffuses in the atmosphere. So even though we're spraying it out, you're probably not getting that really lethal dose assuming maybe sort of. And so the use of any of these things in certain cases might be really beneficial, but when we scale them up to something the size of half of Texas becomes significantly 
more problematic. So we really need to evaluate all of our solutions, not just on kind of an individual level, but as a scalable level in terms of how that's gonna work, or we need to make sure that we really tailor our scientific solutions to small problems and make sure we're monitoring those as we go. Yeah, great point. Uh, we have another comment here uh, from Joan. It's a question. Uh, maybe Bede, you could tackle this one. So she asks, how can we get religions to educate those they reach with this information? And I take it she's, um, you know, prompted by your remarks about the potential of religion here. So I think maybe a question would be, okay, how do we get religion to mobilize on these issues? How do they educate people? What, what, what do you see as possible ways in which that might happen? Um, well, I think it really needs to happen again on the local level and in, in your parishes and your temples and your synagogues. But there, there does seem to be like a disconnect between, you know, what um, the religious leaders are saying uh, globally and, and what actually happens uh, on the ground. Um, you know, for example, I don't know how many Catholics are even aware of Laudato Si, much less what it teaches, much less actually in, in enacting it. And you know, part of that is, I think, because they're concerned about uh, the, the rise of secularism, which is something that all the religions are concerned about. Uh, so they're just trying to <laughs> keep the uh, 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 people coming back to their temples and synagogues and, and churches, and um, aren't really doing enough to um, uh, really invite them into the, the richness of, of their traditions and how their traditions uh, actually are addressing so many of these social and environmental problems. Hmm. Good, we have a lot of questions about what the consumer can do. Uh, let, me, let me read a few of these and, and anybody can feel free to jump in here. Um, so one question from an anonymous attendee says, if, if some of the blame lies on the consumers, what are some of the changes and choices that consumers can make to better the situation? So we've, we've kind of mentioned a few things here, but let's, let's tackle that one head on. Like, the people in the audience here, all of us here on the panel, we, we can do something to affect this situation. But what, what would that involve? What should we do, practically speaking? Anybody? Well, I don't know. If, if I could pipe in maybe a bit more abstract before getting to the practical, as, as I was saying before that, um, you know, a cornerstone of Catholic social ethics is, is human dignity. And as I said earlier, that, that a violation of uh, human dignity on the other part of the globe is going to uh, affect us um, you know, back here at home. And, and I think you see that when um, you, you see the, um, what was it, the Black Friday footage of uh, people uh, rushing like animals, uh, uh, like wolves um, after a chunk of meat when they're just you know, ripping the clothes off the rack without even looking at them or, or anything. Uh, I, I think of those people and how they're really um, not living to their full um, human potential or their full human dignity. And it's because of uh, giving into their appetites, right? So um, abstractly speaking, uh, controlling your appetites, that is controlling your uh, 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 consumerism, right? Yeah. So consumerism is really so, so much of the problem. Yeah. More practically speaking, it has to do with uh, educating yourself or even even I'll just stop there by saying just caring, being aware of the problem and, and caring ab about uh, the manufacturing of, of your goods and, and where they come from. Hmm. Love it. Good. Uh, anybody else? Kyle, Mike, Nicole. I mean, I'll just say one thing. I mean, we, we talked a lot about how you can vote with your dollars and make choices about not buying the new clothes, even though it's really difficult. I mean, one way that you can help improve the alternatives for the workers in some of these places is you can donate um, or lend through microfinance institutions that allow you um, to provide, you know, may potentially provide opportunity for or, or other business opportunities. Now, the development economics community is has been divided on the impact of microfinance and at one point it was touted as a panacea for ending poverty and it's been kind of shown that that's not true, but that it can impact the lives of, of individuals and potentially provide other alternative income, um, especially maybe in the short term or even in the long term. Um, so like, you know, websites like kiva.org where you can, you know, target, you know, your loan um, and it, it'll get paid back uh, can be a really effective way to improve 
the alternatives um, for some of these workers. Hmm. Um, I'll offer one practical solution, and uh, this is not intended as an advertisement, but it is a New Hampshire company, so uh, we'll make an exception. Um, but but Timberland has a uh, has a joint venture with Thread, this company that uh, um, uses uh, plastic water bottles from the streets of Haiti. Um, and, and actually uh, manufacture some of uh, Timberland shoes with the um, with this material, and uh, and and it actually allows for the development. It not just makes an environmental impact, but actually allows for for human development in in Haiti as people have built businesses around collecting the garb uh, the the plastic bottles and recycling centers, and these have all kind of. Um, exploded from the bottom up uh in haiti so um that's one i'm sure there's lots of other other companies that that are doing things like that um but there there are some small solutions out there well you advertise for timberland and it, and it actually brings up this whole topic of advertising which also <laughs> has prompted a couple questions and it actually came out in the film if you recall so meg uh points out i like everyone's points very much Nicole added the social influence of fashion and our need to be fashionable and change with the trends is obviously right. I'd like to add, however, that this influence of society is not neutral or disinterested, disinterested and didn't rise out of nowhere. It's created by the companies themselves through advertising. The people who make the profits from the clothing also create the trends and the seasons and the need for more clothing. And we all fall prey to it, but they invented it. And then Connie, uh, also, just sent in a question uh, that says, let's see if I can find it. I lost it. Oh, Connie, where's your question? But to, it was to the effect of um, that the advertising industry bears responsibility for this whole phenomenon of consumerism, of, um, of, uh, of, of having to buy uh, new than the latest fashion. So what does everybody think about the advertising industry and their responsibility in all this? Now, by the way, the film paints a very dark picture of the advertising industry and I think likens it to the Nazi propaganda machine, if I recall. Yes. Um, but what, what do people think about advertising? Well, it, it has to do, you know, I, I mentioned before, um, the, the human uh, uh, part of being human is controlling your appetites and acting rationally. And I, I think what advertising does is that it, it appeals to our uh, animalistic nature and sidetracks uh, uh, reason. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we like to think of ourselves as, as reasonable, but, but we are moved by um, images, by, by music and, and are manipulated that way. So I think it goes back again to consumerism that instead of consumer, consuming ads, um, protect yourself from ads and, and have some self-awareness that, uh, that you are consuming them even if volu involuntarily. And, and instead, and I'm glad this came up because um, I, I do want to, uh, again, urge people to, to see the film because the, the film itself is, uh, uh, you know, is providing images, is providing stories, and it really takes advantage of, of film as a medium uh, for, for changing people's minds and changing people's attitudes. Hmm. I can't help but think, though, just to defend uh, our, uh, all of our friends in the advertising world, that the advertisers are really kind of responding to what human beings want and need. I mean, company hires them to, you know, advertise their products. So it's kind of like blaming the messenger in some ways, right? Um, you know, are they really the ones who are creating this whole phenomenon? But then again, it's a hugely influential industry. So I don't want to say that they're not responsible. Um, so Joyce is asking what the name of the film is. Yeah, it's called True Cost. Um, and... I think it's available on many of the uh, streaming platforms, whether it be Amazon or Netflix. Um, but there's also a community license that Gostown Public Library has uh, provided. Thank, their, thank them very much. Um, and we will send that out after in a follow-up email, uh, Joyce, uh, in case you, you need that. So, um, Okay, we are almost out of time. Lillian has a couple questions I would like to throw um, uh, at you panelists. Um, she asks, how do we make it more accessible for underprivileged communities to have quality clothes that are ethically produced and affordable? Great question, Lillian. 
Um, the most affordable clothes, unfortunately, are the ones that we're talking about, made in sweatshops. So how do we make it more accessible for these underprivileged communities to have quality clothes that are ethically produced and affordable? Anybody? It's a toughie. <laughs> Come on, somebody, panelists. Well, well what help. if? Well, what if? You know, we, we, we're, we're going to... The, the, you know the uh, you know sadly the, the poor will continue to to struggle. But what if all of the the surplus clothing in in Goodwill and and, and through St. Vincent de Paul and elsewhere was actually originally uh, sourced as uh, being ethically produced? Can we imagine that? That'd be fantastic. Hmm. Hmm. Well, okay, so we have underprivileged communities here in the United States, even here in New Hampshire, even in Manchester. So let's, let's be practical. So, um, you know, they need clothing. Um, is there a way that we can help them? Uh, Connie suggests, one of our uh, audience members, that we can donate some of our own clothing instead of throwing it in a goodwill bin where it ends up, we don't know where it doesn't end up in the goodwill, I'm not sure. Um, we can maybe find local community organizations uh, like families in transition that uh, we can donate some of our clothing to and it'll serve the immediate population. So again, it comes to back to this, maybe caring, as you said, Bede earlier, caring a little bit and then taking the time, as Mike pointed out earlier in the, uh, the, the episode here, the, to, to find out the information that we need in order to make the right choices. Um, it does take a little bit of work, but, but it can make a difference. Any other thoughts to Lillian's question? I, I think I... I would say um, that uh, if you know, I I, th I think I like the idea of, of starting small or starting with what we can control, and right, I we only know our ourselves and, and our own clothing budgets and and what we can afford and and not afford. Um, so the real question I think comes down to it, what are we willing to do with that, um, and then working out from there what. Um, okay, how can we make this the the industry itself more access, uh, more uh, sustainable, more um, more accessible to uh, to those who might not have access to this kind of clothing? Right. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, again, I think uh, you know, innovation uh, uh, will will open up the the. the the markets. You know, it wasn't long ago that only a privileged few would have a mobile phone. And then it became that everyone had a mobile phone and now most people have a smartphone. Um, you know, even, even in developing countries, uh, some of those developing countries have completely sidestepped the, uh, you know, the, the cable system and they're all wireless now. Yeah. Um, so I have a number of questions here. Uh, Nicole, it seems that your remarks about the social pressures really struck a chord. Um, you know, uh, someone says here earlier, Nicole said how her students feel socially expected to keep up with trends. Are social media brands to blame for pushing and prompting fast fashion behavior? For example, Instagram is a new update where you can buy clothes in under 30 seconds, which is making this almost too accessible. Um, there is this cultural pressures and, 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 and these, are, these are larger forces than any, any one of us, I suppose, can control. Um, what would you say, Nicole? How would you respond to your students and, and their remarks about the cultural pressures they're feeling? I think Tough question. It's something, well, it's, it's complicated because telling them just not to care, that doesn't matter. But I, I also wonder, and this goes back to a little bit of the advertising and marketing question, is that if we want to try to, as educators, we spend a lot of time telling them to critically read the news and the newspaper and critically assess their sources and, and really think about the information they're being presented. But we don't say that about advertisements most of the time. We don't tell them to critically evaluate the clothes they're buying or why Instagram seems to think I need those yoga pants or whatever that thing is that I literally can buy in two clicks. And, right, we tell them that a lot about news articles, but maybe we need to shift also some of the things we're talking about and thinking about marketing and advertising in the same ways from things as basic as clothing and shoes in the same way we tell them to evaluate weird technology or you know, new fads or new diets. Maybe we need to really think about advertising more broadly and really 
speak about it in a different way or approach it in a very, very different way, like Mike was talking about with informed consumers and really doing your research, but really applying that to the way we're doing our marketing and having people look at marketing. That's interesting you say that. So the film suggests that advertising is part of the problem. And I think we all agree that's, that's probably true, but they could be part of the solution too. Um, the messaging that we, that we create around these products and around this industry could emphasize um, some of these more important factors such as human dignity and human rights and sustainable uh, clothing uh, manufacturing, et cetera. So I like that. That's a positive. Uh, well, well, they, they could, but, but probably not. I mean, that's why I, I think it, it'd be better for uh, people to, to choose what they you know, visually and orally consume. So um, there's lots of alternative uh, uh, sources on, on the internet. I'm, I'm thinking of one example of uh, the Netflix documentaries uh, or, or other documentaries on, on other channels. And one of them is uh, by these guys known collectively as the minimalists who have started a whole uh, movement that's become actually quite popular uh, called minimalism that is arguing that, look, have less stuff, you'll be happier. Right. Um, so so I, I, I think that's part of it. But actually, I want to get back to, to Nicole and, and some of her comments, just to say that um, we need to acknowledge, I think, that the, the burden of so many of these injustices is uh, gender biased uh, towards women. There's um, more women who are working uh, under these uh, horrible conditions and women have more uh, pressure, I think, to, to keep up with uh, fashion trends, whereas uh, for us men, you know, the, the, the changes are more durable, I think. So we're, we're just about out of time here. Um, I'm just going to just mention, reinforce one thing that was mentioned early on that I love. We never got back to, but I'll leave it out there as a question for the audience. Uh, and that was Kyle's question when he asked, what, what are people for? Um, I love that question. When we look at these, um, these, uh, these exploited people in these sweatshops, um, we should ask, what, what are people for when we see uh, the American consumer uh, being uh, influenced by, um, by the advertisers or by these corporate interests and rushing through these stores to get the last thing on the rack? Uh, what, what are people for? I, I think that's a profound question that's worth all of us dwelling on more. But I want to thank all of you uh, for your insights and your, um, your perspective today on what I think is a topic that that hopefully is, is we're all growing in awareness about uh, and, and, and we can maybe move the needle on. I wanna thank um, the Gosstown Public Library, uh, um, the St. Anselm uh, College Geisel Library and all of our participants uh, for your, um, your insight, your questions and for your, um, your attendance today. So uh, please keep an eye on the center's website going forward um, for some upcoming programs and some big news about the name of the center. But I'll just leave you with that without saying any more. I want to thank everybody again for um, a wonderful session, and we'll look forward to seeing you all next time. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.